What's up, what's up, what's up, beautiful people? Welcome back to another episode of the Grief Bully Podcast. I am your host, Jay Nicole. Today is Monday, October the 28th. We are episode 11. Uh, last week, we had a great episode. We had Shore Award in here. If you have not had the chance, I would definitely encourage you, go back, download that episode, check it out. Uh, just a quick recap, we talked about a burden or a blessing. Sometimes you're in a situation where at that particular time, it feels like a burden, whether that's being a caretaker or something along those lines. And then in the next season, it actually seems like a blessing because, you know, maybe you lost that person and now that's all the memories that you had. We talked about grieving someone twice because we realized that that is possible. Also, the benefits of therapy, which you talk about every single week. So I personally think it was a great episode. I definitely would encourage you, like I said, go check that out uh, and let us know your feedback. So episode 11, Grief Bully Podcast. We have had 10 episodes uh, previously and today we have another guest. I am not in here solo. We have our first male guest and I'm excited to have him on the show. Our special guest is uh, a well-known, up-and-coming, or already at the top, comedian in the area. Some of you guys may know him, and if you don't, his name is Garnett Briscoe. He is going to do us the pleasure of coming on here today and sharing a story that, guys, I really don't know uh, if I can make it up. It seems like something that would be pretty much all of our worst nightmare, and he's willing to go in and just share his story with us to help you guys out. And that's the whole point of having this show is to have people on here to share their story, raw, uncut, just let's get to it because there's other people out there. You may not be going through a similar exact situation as him, but you have faced levels of grief that like you may not have come back from. And honestly... I don't know how my guest has made it through this, so I just want to welcome him to the show. Garnett, what's up? What's going on? Thank you for having me. No, thank you for being here. I'm excited about it. You know, I was thinking like, okay, we're going to be talking about grief. That's a very serious subject, but mm-hmm. then we have one of the funniest people I, I know on the show. Uh, how is that going to go? So I'm sure we'll <laughs> have some laughs, but we definitely want to thank you for coming on here. For sure. Now, I was real thankful just for the invite, though, honestly, to get a chance to, uh, you know, just speak my truth. So, yeah, yeah, so so guys, listen, I, I actually met Garnett many years ago uh, through a mutual friend of mine. Haven't really kept in touch. I saw him on Instagram. I'm like, okay, I see him doing his thing. I vaguely remember his story. I didn't know it 100% at the time. Mm-hmm. And then I, you know, I reached out to one of my friends. I'm like, yeah, you know, Garnett, he was the one that, you know, and started talking a little bit about his story. And then more recently... You put a post up on Instagram, and I was like, wow, like, he's he's really laying it all out there. I didn't know if it was something that you felt comfortable talking about or, or that you have expressed often. So I'm like, yo, I got to get him on here because his story and his testimony is so powerful that I think it's going to really help a lot of people. So I want to get into it. You said that there's there's nothing we can't talk about. Nope. Uh, so first, let's tell people a little bit about yourself, who you are, what you do, and then we can kind of get into your grief journey. Uh, I'm about to be 30 next week, uh, in a week and a half. Okay, and shout I'm, out to 30. I'm kind of excited about that. Uh, I think age is a beautiful thing. Uh, like you spoke on earlier, I'm um, up and coming comedian. Um, other than that, I work a nine to five, um, hang out with my friends, regular stuff. But other than that, the most exciting thing right now in my life is hitting the stage. That's it. That's a, that's a great thing. And I think that's going to tie that in here, how comedy became you know, outlet for you or some sort of therapy to one regard mm-hmm. or the other because that's something that a lot of us find ourselves reaching for something to hold on to when, when life has really just kicked us in the throat. So let's get into your story, man. Like from what I understand, you were eight years old and your life just changed. So let's let's go if you feel comfortable. Yeah, so um, I grew up regular household. Well, in the 90s, I guess the regular. Right. Um, <laughs> my mom, my dad... Uh, my dad was a drug dealer, um, and my mom, you can, you know, just a regular stay-at-home mom, um, but I saw a lot of domestic violence growing up. Wow. So even before the actual incident, you know, I would see it in the house. Um, you know, me and my brother would try to stop it. I have a brother that's five years older than me. Okay. Um, so it was me and him always in the house. Um, so, yeah, so that's like the, the beginning stages of it. Um, So when I was eight years old, it was actually um, December 31st, 98, if I'm not mistaken. (laughs) Excuse me. 
Um, my mom is on her way to church, and you know, looking back in hindsight, it's like things happen for a reason. Um, and she never really goes to church because she's going to church with my aunt wow. that night. Then, so it was New Year's Eve, and she was going yeah, to church. Yeah, and it was like that's the first time I can recall her like up and going to church, and that's what she was doing. So it was a packed, a packed house uh, that night at my at my crib. Um, usually. It's just me and my brother, but my two cousins were also staying with us at the time. So it was me, my brother, my two cousins. My mom uh, had her friend over, and they were going to go meet my aunt at church. Um, I'm guessing, well, at the time I didn't know, but my mom and dad had got into an argument earlier that day about taking my brother to the skating rink. Excuse me. And so when he, I guess he rushed home. They had an argument, him rushing home drunk off alcohol, and, you know, the incident transpired. She's fresh out the shower, and my room is like, it's the bathroom, so as long as you walk up the stairs, to the right, there's the, um, what's that, the laundry room, and then right next to the laundry room is my room that's actually facing the hallway. So I'm literally watching my dad walk up the stairs, the door is wide open, but to the bathroom, and then, you know, I just see him firing shots off. So it wasn't really like a much like exchange back and forth. Um, after that, he ran down the stairs and I went to go see what happened in the bathroom. At that point, you know, I saw my mom uh, shot and laying on the floor. Um, so that's pretty much the incident right there. Afterwards, you know, we ended up going next door to the neighbor's house. You know, they're calling the cops and things like that. And, you know, just being young, I don't know everything what was like really going on, even though I was a, a smart child, but everything just was happening so fast, couldn't really comprehend everything. Um, but as I got older and, you know, hearing stories or just reading the newspaper and stuff like that, I'm um, able to get all sides of what actually happened that night, but also everything leading up to it. So, so that's, a, that's a very traumatic experience. You know, and I always thank our guests for sharing because you don't have to do that. Mm -hmm. And I know that that can be difficult because every time you tell the story, you're reliving that. You were so vivid in your description that mm -hmm. you, I was there with you. Like, I'm watching it happen, come up the steps. And I never knew that you actually saw it happen, like the yeah. shots firing and hearing that in, in that experience. Do you remember anything that you were thinking when you... You saw your mom there, or were you too young, or you just can't recall right now? Um, I really can't recall exactly how I felt, um, but it was like, it's almost like everything kind of slowed down at once. Um, you know, my I just remember, you know, crying, of course, my brother crying, you know, everybody just crying, but not really, like, my emotions, everything wasn't moving fast. It was just, like, slowed down, and I was able to see and look and, you know, some of those visions will last forever, unfortunately. But, um, yeah, I, that's the best way I can describe, like, my emotions during that moment. No, you did a great job describing that. And what you said, too, is that some of them will, unfortunately, last forever because you were able to paint that picture to us again. Mm -hmm. Now, if you don't mind me asking, at that time, did you know that your mom was deceased or you just, in your mind, saw that she had been shot? Um, I think a part of me felt like she was and then, you know, the hopeful person, uh, you know, tried to make sense of what happened and is like, you know, just praying for the best. Um, but it wasn't any movement on site, like, and I vividly remember that. And, you know, they, from what they said, you know, she lasted to like around midnight or whatever before she passed away. But I knew what I saw at that moment. And... Like I said, the, the part that was, like, real was, like, no, she wasn't dead. Yeah, that's a that's a very difficult situation to be in, for sure. So you're eight years old, is that correct? Mm -hmm. I got that from the newspaper article. Yeah. You're eight, so your brother's probably about 13 at yeah. the time. When you went next door, like, do you recall how your life started to move after that? Like, I, I'm just curious. So, okay, your dad ran out and, and left. What was there like a police chase? Do you know anything about like how yeah, he was so apprehended? There, um, you know, when we end up going next door, you know, everybody's worried, neighborhoods worried. We lived in a in a white neighborhood, 
uh, Pine Hill, New Jersey. So I think we might have been the only black people actually on our block. Um, so, you know, it's no crime going on out there. Right, right. So to have something, you know, like that, gunshots, is kind of crazy. Um, so I remember, you know, hearing them talking and stuff like that. And everybody that's there, you know, my aunts are rushing over and all that stuff. They're trying to, like, make me go to sleep as if, like, you know, I, I get it. But it's like, like I said, I'm not a regular eight-year-old at that point. Excuse me. Like, I'm not. I, I know I know what's going on, and I want to know what's going on. So, you know, we're in the bedroom hearing everybody talk. Um, you know, I remember the moment where they said that they actually, you know, apprehended him. And, you know, like, it was like a sigh of, like, relief, but it was also like, well, like, what's next? Like, what's now? Like, where do we go from here? So, you know, even that night, you know, um, it was a lot of change. Um, you know, having to stay with my aunt and realizing I don't have a home to go to. You know, realizing that my cousins that stay with us probably might not stay with us. Um, and for some reason, I had a feeling that now I have two separate families and I want. Wow, that's that's deep. That's a lot to comprehend at eight years old. And obviously, like you said, you weren't the average eight year old because you remember so many of those details and mm -hmm. just like starting to put it all together. And do you feel like anyone explained that to you? Because you said that you started putting it together yourself and just kind of thinking like that. I'm always curious when it comes to our traumatic experiences, especially in the African-American community, mm -hmm. how we deal with that as far as communicating to people what is actually going on and, and how we're going to move forward from here. Well, uh, so like my family, they tried to hide a lot of stuff from me, you know, just because I am eight years old you know, not trying to give me that benefit of doubt of like, okay, like he needs to know this to like push forward. But I'm also like at that point, I don't show my emotions or feelings. So it was like, no matter, even if they, if, if, even if they would have told me, I might not have gave an emotion that they were expecting or wanted at that point. Um, but they also did hide a lot of things or at least tried to. Uh, so a lot of the understanding just came from observing and like I said, so it was growing up seeing certain things and already understanding. And maybe that came from also being a younger brother. So, you know, you always run around and trying to be like your older sibling. So yeah. you start picking up things a little bit faster than maybe other kids your age. So I was able to understand a lot, like I said, just early on from that standpoint without having so much of like a conversation of, hey, this is what happened. This is why it happened. It was more so like, I, I think I got a good grasp of what happened, and I'll just deal with it however I'm going to deal with it. No, and that, that's, you're echoing a story for a lot of us, you know, for a lot of people who, of course, you know, when you have someone that young, you want to shelter them from it. Mm -hmm. But when we realize, in, in hindsight, like, was that actually the best thing for that person? Maybe we won't exactly know, but did you go to your mom's funeral? Did they have a funeral for your mom? Like, do you recall that part yeah, of it? Yeah, she actually, it was like a huge funeral. Like, that's something that was like, <laughs> like, I remember it being hundreds and hundreds of people. Wow. Um, that's something that they did not let me in to, like, see it. Um, and a part of me wanted to, but also a part of me didn't want to, because at that age, I started to also understand that the body is just a body like she's not there anyway and up to that point I've already experienced a lot of death whether it be cousins uh, my grandmom died eight uh, six months beforehand okay wow. um you know from a heart attack um so it was like between five six seven eight I've been seen a lot been to a lot of funerals so at that point it was like yeah I, I don't need to go in but well I like to see my mom maybe but already know you know she's not there that's that's not so you there. didn't so you didn't see her body in a casket uh yeah just not at the funeral so um, okay so maybe like the viewing or yeah, something yeah, yeah yeah and that's something i didn't enjoy at all more so because like i said like, it's not her it didn't look like her no that thank you for sharing that you definitely becoming very transparent there mm -hmm. was that the last time you saw your dad um no so so my relationship with him uh, obviously became difficult because uh, I didn't know how to feel because on one one side of the coin that's your dad 
you know, and you remember all of the things he's done for you. You remember all the things he's done for people, how he's treated you um, up to that point. And then on the other side, it's a monster. It's something that's like unbelievable that you can only like see on TV. Um, so I really didn't want to talk to him or see him, but I have a whole other side of my family that I was extremely close with, you know. Your dad's side. Yeah. Um, that, you know, they always at least wanted me to talk to him and things like that and, you know, maybe to go see him. But at eight years old, that's something that I wasn't ready for mentally or emotionally to put myself out there in a position of not knowing, you know, just exactly how to feel. Uh, so I did not see him in person until I was 18. Oh, wow. So from that day, seeing him firing shots at your mom, you didn't see him again until you were 18. Yeah, that's because I never even thought about it like that. Like, never. I I never thought about it like that. But, yeah. So um, that was like a more of a conscious decision. You know, at like teenager, you think you're coming into Right, right. Get your man, get a little hair on your chest. I got got to go do this. I'm going to make it happen. And I'm going to like feel better and... You know, like I said, like my, my grandma, his mom, um, who was like, I was extremely close with. She just passed uh, recently this year. Um, so, yeah, you know, she always wanted me to, you know, go see him or talk to him. Uh, because at the end of the day, that's still her son. And at the end of the day, that's still my dad. And we both know we did wrong. But how can we overcome this to, you know, make things better? So I actually did go see him. And that was like a... That was a terrible experience, not seeing him, but the whole entire thing. As far as like seeing jail or well, prison, what Talk it looks about like. It. That's, that's a rough experience. Um, and then actually realizing that it's other people in here in similar situations. It's other people in here that's doing life. And I had a lot of questions for him. And we went as a group. And I felt like. I couldn't ask those questions in front of everybody. So the questions that I needed to get answered, I didn't even put out there to see everybody else kind of happy. And to me, to, I guess, dampen the mood by, you know, I I don't know what I would have did in that moment. I have no clue what he would have did in that moment. But everybody else, you know, was just happy. So I suppressed what I actually wanted to do in order for, you know, everybody else to have a good time. Wow, that that stinks. That sucks that you weren't able to actually like have the experience that you thought. And yeah. you know, so did you ever get a chance to talk to him beyond that, or you only yeah. went that one time yeah. when you were eighteen? So I've I've only been once. Uh, so I, last time I see him, when I was you were 18. eighteen. Oh wow. Um, but I've talked to him. Um, I I I got a chance to ask that question when I was I think I was about twenty two. Um, I reached out to him. I was actually going through like a lot of stuff in my life at the time and everything just kind of settled down in that moment. And that was the first time that I didn't have an outlet to, you know, uh, hide my feelings. It wasn't basketball around. It wasn't a girl. It wasn't working. It wasn't, I had a chance to sit and deal with everything. And it was like depressing. It it was really depressing. I went from, I'm already a skinny dude, right? (laughs) So at the time I went from, uh, about 145 to about 119. Wow. And it's like, I look back at pictures, it's like, dude, that was sick. Like, <laughs> completely sick. Yeah. Um, But that was during that time of just like, you know, stressing and everything. And I took that time to ask those questions because I, I had to deal with everything. Everything was hitting me at once. So, um, you know, I, I reached out to my grandma and got his information. And I probably wrote like a five or six page letter and I just remember crying. While you were writing it? Yeah, just just crying and sending it off. And I'm pretty sure it's like tears on the paper. Wow. Um, and you know, just crying. And after I wrote it, it was like, wow, that felt, that felt okay. I still wanna hear this answer, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that felt okay. And uh, you know, I really didn't, I always cared how he would respond. That was the first time I didn't care. I didn't care. This is like, I need this right now. I need to know what's happening. I need to know what happened. And, you know, he actually wrote me back about a 10-page letter. And um, 
it was it was as much truth as he could tell. Uh, I'm not saying he's a liar at all. I'm just saying I know it's hard to give everything at once. Right. Especially in a situation where you, at this point, you don't even know me. You remember me at eight years old. So you, and I know certain things that transpired that led up to that. Like a, people think kids not smart. Right. <laughs> it was like, I'm not, I can piece some stuff together. Um, but he did tell the truth. And I remember reading it and just not wanting to write him back. Not because I was mad or sad. It was more so it was like, it's done. Like, that's a chapter in my life. Like, I got the answer that I wanted. Like, I've been waiting this whole time for it. And um, it was a, it was like a surreal moment. Like, I felt, I felt like a weight has been, like, lifted off my shoulders. And we was back in contact uh, probably for a couple months on and off, uh, just through letters. And then, you know, that stopped. I really didn't care to, you know, have a relationship with him at all because I got what I wanted. Um, not until probably last about year, yeah, probably a little over a year, um, we start having more dialogue and, you know, talking on the phone and writing. Like this year, currently? Yeah. Okay. And, um, yeah, I think that's helped me out so much just personally and in a lot of stuff that um, I'm going through and I'm going to, you know, go through in the future. And that kind of happened, you know, like I said, maybe talking at my grandma's house when she still was alive and, you know, on the phone and what they always, like, try to, like, teach me early uh, when that happened was you don't want to lose twice. You know, you... You lost one parent. We can't do anything about that, even though it was at the hands of your second right. parent. Right, yeah, for real. But it's, you only get one mom, you only get one dad. Unfortunately, this was the cards you were dealt with. Now, it's up to you to, you know, salvage whatever is left and make the best of the situation. And, you know, I never really understood it early why my grandma would want me to talk to him and talk to him and talk to him she'll bring up stories and stories and stories and it was like damn like why are you like I don't, I'm not trying to I didn't come over here for this I can't right. <laughs> kick it with you why right. are you doing this like stop trying to do that but it was also a layer of making him human to me as well um and you know even on my mom's side of the family you know they know what he did was wrong but that's not the total package of him you know all of us got things with us but True. you know his may be completely extreme but right. he's done stuff for people that you can't forget about you know at the end of the day he was a good person to my family members you know to my grandma to my grandma like he still you know he took in my brother me and my brother had different dads oh okay so you know he took in my brother from three years old and he's he was the driving force my my brother's dad really wasn't around like that so his dad was my dad. Um, oh, and to go back, bring my brother. So the thing that made me like really reach out to my dad was had a, a conversation with my brother. And my brother, after it happened, he had to move to Arizona with his dad because that's his biological father. Um, so he moved in with his dad. And, you know, our relationship kind of been... It's always good because that's my brother. And we always... Excuse me. You know, we, we have that bond no matter what. But the talking and the seeing each other is, you know, the distance in between is, is rough. But um, he ended up saying something like, you know, I, I talked to your dad. And I'm like, wow, like that's like, by what? Right. He's like, you know, like, I just been in communication with him and I really think you should too. And I had to take a second and think about it. And I was like... So if you can forgive my dad, then what would make me not, you know, at least try? <clears throat> and that's your mom, too. So it was like, wow. And, you know, the way my brother is and the way I am, we completely different. He's a little bit more uh, irresponsible than me <laughs> uh, in the sense where, you know, he's five years older, but I'm probably the more responsible one. So to, you know, have my brother say something like that is like, Wow, ah, okay, okay. I can 
I'm at least hear them out and try it. And like I said, mix with the conversations that, you know, I had growing up. Um, yeah, I decided to see what was going on and we've been in contact ever since. And I think it's really, um, I actually talked to him about two or three, two or three days ago. Now, who knows what's going to happen when he gets out. But like I said, it's more so um, just not trying to lose twice at, at, at the end of the day and seeing what can work for me and also realize that he's in a worse position than I am. Like, prison is living hell. He, he has to live with the consequences of his actions of not knowing his son and, you know, not being on the outside, not being there, you know, as your mom is sick and ends up passing. That's something I'm not, you know, I'm not dealing with that. I'm, right. I can be okay. You know, I'm I'm not in hell, even if, you know, hell happened for a moment. I'm I'm gonna be okay. So I actually feel bad for his situation and he needs someone to talk to. I'm pretty sure, you know, it brightens up his life the fact that he can even call his son and, you know, hear his voice after what he's done. So I know he's sorry, um and like I said, he told his truth. Um, and if I'm going to forgive somebody, I have to forgive you. There is no thing where I can halfway forgive you or is I have to own it and we're going to move forward from it and just see, just see what happens. That's all. Yeah. You, you said a lot, man. I mean, I'm just taking it all in here and I think you answered my biggest question was, did you actually forgive him? And it seems like you said that you did. I'm blown away because I had no idea that you were in contact with him currently. And I think that you said so much today that I don't have to say much today. <laughs> I think my audience have to take so much from that. Like you're you're preaching to me in areas in my life where, you know, when it comes to forgiveness, we're talking about not being able to forgive people for some of the smallest things. But you were able as a black man. Let me just say that that you were able to initiate and have a conversation relationship with. The person, I don't understand it's your father, but mm -hmm. still the person that took your mom from here and actually extend forgiveness. And by you doing that, it not only helped him, but you said that it helped you and helped yourself, you know, be able to heal. And at this point in your life, as a man, what it seems like to me is that you kind of needed or maybe wanted mm -hmm. your father, regardless of what actually transpired. Like you said, that is your dad and not wanting to lose twice. We talked about that last week where our guest grieved her dad twice because she mm -hmm. didn't have a relationship with him then they got close and then he died right. so it was like all that time she didn't have him and then now she had him so your story has changed me for sure today and just all of those things um I know one thing I do want to ask you and I'm sure you have a a good answer to that is if you had to choose a color for your grief because I've been asking this question I've been very intrigued by the answers and I mean it could be from when you were eight years old and, and, and growing up and having that grief journey experience, or it could be present day as a man that's approaching 30. I'm just really curious. Maybe you can say if you had to pick a color when you were eight and nine and 10 versus now, you know, being a grown man, mm -hmm. like I would definitely love to hear your answer with that. I'll say it's gray. Um, I think gray describes it in a point where um, that's something that you can get used to. Um, you know, on a on a cloudy day, I'm pretty sure people in Seattle, Washington, is like, yeah, it's just a normal day. Mm -hmm. They only notice the sun when the sun is actually out. Wow. Other than that, is it is what it is, and I'm guessing that's from me, you know, internalizing everything and just moving as I do. Um, actually, I had this conversation recently where, <laughs> you know, I'm um, I grew up, you know, I probably I probably was depressed for so long that like. I didn't even notice. Wow. It, you know, we just say, oh, yeah, it's just my life. It is what it is. And you just keep pushing. You move forward until, you know, one day you just like, oh, shit, I didn't know I could even feel like this. And I think that's where I'm at now. And that's where I've been at, you know, last couple of years where I didn't know I could feel this good. And that's what made me look back and reflect on it. It's like, hey, I'm probably, <laughs> you know, I'm probably yeah. depressed all of this time. Um, I just found a way to deal with it in the ways that I wanted to deal with it. So yeah, I can, the best way I can describe it is, it is great. No, I think that's definitely a great answer and very enlightening in that way that you didn't even know 
like until you weren't. So it's like you don't know till you know. Right. When they say that yep. like you had no idea that you were depressed and just walking around like that until you weren't. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a story for a lot of us, you know, for sure in that regard. So couple things mm-hmm. um i do want to bounce into our love and memory segment though because that's a part of our show that's very important to us is to show love and, and light to people who have gone on our loved ones it's important to humanize them like mm-hmm. you said i mean you humanize your father and we want to humanize our loved ones that have gone on so with you being here today our in love and memory segment from the grief bully podcast we want to extend our condolences to yourself and your family okay. our in love and memory segment today goes out to lisa choice that was garnett briscoe's mother so i'm sure that she's extremely proud of the man that you've become everything that you're doing for yourself and for everybody else out here that you shared with today so we want to send our love out to your mom continue to fight to fly high and uh, i'm sure that you're very proud of your young man here both of them i know your brother but you know he's he's doing a lot of good things as well being able to communicate with your Mm -hmm. father and such and so that's an amazing part there um, our inspirational boost is a part of our show that we like to give a quote or something thought provoking. You know, before we head out, our shows are, are on Mondays. So today's Monday, October the 28th. Our inspirational boost is brought to us by Adina J Designs. They may create and inspire us with decorated apparel, wood signs, custom tumblers, and more. Follow them on Instagram at Adina J Designs, A D E N A J A Y D E S I G N S. Our quote today is We fall. We break, we fail, but then we rise, we heal, we overcome. And that quote is unknown. And I think that was just an echo of today's episode, man. I think you you fall, you fell, uh, you you were broken, uh, you failed again, but then you rose and you healed and you overcome and you're continuing to overcome. So before we get out of here today, if you just will leave the audience with two things, I mean, man, I don't even know what else you could really leave us with because your story itself just em- embodies the epitome of resilience and it, and it really is resonating with me. So mm-hmm. I'm certainly sure to my audience out there, guys, you got to take a lot from this story. I encourage you to listen to this episode actually more than once and just go back. There's so much there. But if you had to leave us with, you know, one or two things just to encourage, inspire, or just some realness for them uh i would appreciate that uh i'll say honestly um one will have to be just um is is everything is bigger than what you think it is um you know i i've been able to not hate a lot of people or not feel any kind of way um, about people or in negative situations because I have something drastic to compare it to. Um, so it's like, like I said, if, if, if a girl cheats on me, that's minor. You know, the, the, that's not the end of the world. I feel like I know what the end of the world feel like. Um, so, you know, I'm able to move on. Um, so it's a lot of a lot of people, you know, that go through everyday life, whether it be work, whether it be, you know, your car just got hit and, you know, you're cursing somebody out about right. it, you know, you just got to get a chance to really look at it and it's like, well, how, how big is this? Like, do, do you have your life? Do you still have means to do what you got to do? Is your family still around? Uh, you know, we all have our bad days, but when you have something to compare it to and none of us are perfect, we all have, you know, a story to tell. Uh, so everyone has something to compare it to. It's not, it's not that big. It's not that big of a deal. Yeah, I agree. I think that that's actually probably going to be part of the, the title for this show because I truly agree with you on that. Before we get out of here, too, we didn't get a chance to... I'm, I'm, I'm uh, bothered, I guess, to an mm-hmm. extent that we didn't get a chance to really talk about your comedy. And I know that's been a big part of your therapy. So I want you to let people know where they can follow you on social media because they can continue to follow your journey, your story, uh, your comedy, whatever okay. upcoming events you have. I definitely would love for you to take the opportunity to plug that where we can follow you on social yeah. media as well as, you know, anything you have. Uh, and how comedy, maybe real quick, how yeah, comedy yeah. has helped you. Um, It's funny because it's, it's always helped me. Um. That's my defense. That was my defense mechanism. Uh, so even growing up before, you know, things, you know, transpired with my parents, you know, uh, my brother used to crack on me all the time. And he used to make me cry. And then <laughs> I used to, like, have to get funny and tell jokes on him and embarrass him in front of, you know, his friends and my cousins and stuff like that. So it's always been there. Uh, once that happened, uh, you know, I still had to go back to school. So I had to face my friends with, you know, 
them reading a newspaper and them knowing and they have parents and you know people coming up and asking questions and I would just deflect and I would deflect with a joke you know to like alright let's change the subject mm -hmm. um, I still do that you know now where it's like I don't want to talk too deep right now so I'm gonna just tell a joke until it's time to you know I, I feel like I want to have a conversation about it um, but yeah I feel like you know that's helped me my entire life as far as that um, I'm finally at the point where I'm able to open up and I want to open up that's why you see posts like you get on the internet because it would be selfish of me to not share that with people you know that's my responsibility we all have a story to tell and I have to t say that out loud I have to you know try to inspire I have to try to you know motivate somebody um, to say hey listen like life is life is always going to throw you curveballs it's always going to hurt you it's always life is the greatest joke in the world wow <laughs> it's that like that's true. the it's what, what are you going to do about it that's so true uh, so it's like you got to be able to laugh at life and roll with the punches and also you know with I feel like I have a great responsibility as well between my friends and the people I don't know where it's like I I just have to share that I have to because I, I don't I don't know who that could help and I got so many um you know people that follow me online that actually hit me up before I posted that and said you know I, I appreciate just the energy that you bring every morning like you make me laugh or yo that quote was dope or like yo he's like like just keep doing what you're doing so it's, it's always people that you know need a good word and what I've been like saying recently I don't know how or why it came up but the world is always going to need three things that's love laughter and music no matter what it's, it's always true. been around and it's always going to continue to be around so that's you know that's it no, thank you for sharing that. And I agree with that quote, and I know you're a big Nipsey Hussle guy. Yeah, and exactly. uh, you actually encouraged me to get more into them just from seeing your posts and so forth. Yeah. So where, where can everybody follow you on, on Instagram? Uh, Sherlock Homeboy on Instagram. Um, I'm pretty sure your audience can spell. Mine's cut it when I had a podcast. I had, <laughs> I had, had, had a dumb audience. Um, Sherlock Homeboy is uh, S-H-E-R-L-O-C-K-H-O-M-E-B-O-I. Uh, so Sherlock Homeboy with an I. Dope. Do you have anything up upcoming events? I think you have something. Yeah, uh, so uh, my birthday is November 5th. I'm having a, a comedy birthday brunch uh, November 9th at Hops Brewery Town in Philly. Um, come out and have a good time. Uh, it's unlimited mimosas. Um, it's always a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> unlimited mimosas. The food is, is, is fire. Uh, the comedians that I have on there are super fire too. A uh, really good friend of mine is headline and she's hilarious. Her name is uh, Tata Sharice. I think uh, I will definitely connect you with her as well. Um, yeah, she's dope. Um, yeah, so the event starts at 12. The show starts at 1, 1.30. Um, and it's going to end over at 5. But, yeah, so just celebrate my birthday. I feel like I may as well do what I love on, you know, on my birthday with the people that I love. So try to get everybody in the room together, have some laughs, listen to some music, you know. And be Share some somebody. love. That's, That's the other it. one, right? That's it. Exactly. That's guys, it. listen. It has been a great episode. We are episode 11. We are wrapping up. Make sure you guys follow him on Instagram. My guy, Garnett Briscoe, is amazing today, me. man. I know you've been killing stages out there, but I'm sure this, this is probably one of your best performances because it was just your true, raw self. And I definitely am going to be in looking forward to looking back to the episode and, and listening to it so follow him on instagram go out show love with him for his birthday we're going to try to be in the building and make sure we can uh, celebrate him as well guys we're going to keep moving with the grief bully uh everything that we talked about today we will have some notes in our show notes you already know i am your host jay nicole guys you can follow me on instagram that's where i spend most of my time don't even bother with facebook uh you want to follow me and see what i'm about you'll follow me there at I underscore A-M underscore J. Nicole, guys. You already know. As always, love and light. Peace. That was, uh, that was dope. I, I enjoyed what you got. Man, you, I, I, I just had to listen.